All right. So you've come to PLMW, uh, which uh, means that you're either embarking on or you're thinking about embarking on a career in programming languages research, which is terrific. Uh, so what is it exactly that PL researchers do? Uh, you may, uh, you know, a lot of uh, new students have uh, the impression, a somewhat romanticized impression, that uh, what we actually do is, uh, you know, spend um, our, uh, you know, spend our days uh, doing deep, serious science, okay? And that, uh, particularly if you work in a formal side of PL like I do, that, you, you know, you go to uh, uh, the blackboard and you roll up your sleeves and you do some hardcore math and logic. Uh, and that's how you spend your entire day. But actually, that's a, a relatively small fraction uh, uh, there's a, of, of what we actually do. There's a, a huge amount of our time is spent actually communicating our ideas that we come up with on the Blackboard to other researchers, either uh, or both by giving talks, which uh, John Hughes will, will tell us about this afternoon, uh, and by writing papers. Okay. So, um, uh, so many of you, uh, you know, probably think, uh, well, I've written a lot of papers in college. You know, I know how to write a paper. What's the big deal here? Um, and, you know, to some extent that's true. I mean, uh, if the target audience of your paper is your college professor. Um, but, uh, uh, but in fact, uh, when we write papers in PL, uh, research papers, we are targeting a much broader audience than that. We're targeting, um, you know, the top experts in the field, like the people you see speaking at Popple and PLMW. And uh, we're also targeting young researchers who are just trying to get a lay of the land, trying to understand the state of the art. Um, and so, uh, so it's actually uh, quite difficult to, uh, to target such a broad uh, range of, of, of readers. So, show of hands, how many of you have actually read a PL research paper, uh, like a Popple paper, a PLDI paper? Okay, lots of you. Um, so, how many of you have uh, read such a paper and uh, thought to yourself, I have no idea what's going on, this is completely incomprehensible? All right, the same number, very good. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, me too, uh, you know, welcome to my world. So, I've been, uh, I've been in doing this for uh, like almost 20 years and uh, I read papers all the time where I have no idea what's going on. Um, and, you know, part of this is, of course, that you may just lack the technical sophistication needed to understand what, what the paper's about. But, uh, in fact, many papers, uh, including papers that get published, uh, are poorly written. And um, so, uh, as a consequence, if you can actually write a clear and accessible paper, uh, wonderful things will happen, okay? I mean, you will have a huge advantage in life. People will enjoy reading your papers. They will learn things from your papers. They'll get, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll be able to uh, understand what you're doing and, you know, build on that research. Uh, your papers will get accepted at astronomically higher rates to conferences like Popple. Um, you know, you'll have impact and fame and make a lot of money. Um, well, maybe. Oh, okay, but, uh, but in, any, in any case, the point is, um, learning to write well is an essential part of becoming uh, a successful researcher. So, um, so why is it so hard to write well, okay? Well, uh, my, my feeling is that the main problem is when people write papers, um, they uh, have a hard time sort of viewing the paper from the reader's perspective. So, uh, you know, when someone writes a paper, they'll, they'll want to present some, their, their piece of research they've done, which is some, uh, some gadget, some mechanism, some technical thing they've invented, okay? And, um, and so <laughs> when they, uh, uh, when they, um, when they write the paper, right, that, that's what's on their mind. Uh, that's the, it's this new thing that they're trying to develop, right? Um, so they'll write the paper from that perspective as if the reader was really, you know, already interested in the technical details of what they're doing. And they'll talk about all this, you know, technical mumbo jumbo about the preaxial gaskets and the XPS latency. And that's what they're really excited about. That's what they want to tell the reader. And the reader is there standing uh, on the side saying, well, uh, okay, but actually uh, what I want to know is what does this thing do? What is it good for? Uh, why do I care? And then maybe if you answer those questions, then I'll be interested in the technical stuff. Um, and so this creates this kind of chasm between the writer and the readers. Uh, the writer, you know, the, basically what the writer wants to communicate to the reader is not exactly what the reader wants to hear. Um, so the good news is there are principles you can follow that will help you with, uh, bridge this chasm, that will help you write clearer, more readable prose based on having an understanding of how readers uh, process information. Um, and that's what I'm going to tell you about today. So, uh, when people think principles of good writing, a lot of people think uh, Strunk and White, the elements of style. How many of you have heard of the elements of style or been, have it, had this recommended to you? Okay, quite a few. Right, so, personally, I really hate this book. Um, and uh, there, I could go into it uh, at length over beer, but uh, the, 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 for the purpose of this talk, the thing I don't like is that some of the key advice from this book, some of the most famous advice, is so vague 
and so high, it's so uh, sort of uh, abstract that it's, it's just not useful. So things like uh, be clear and omit needless words, two of the most famous bits of, bits of advice from this book. Um, well, you know, if I, knew how to, if, I, uh, if I knew how to write clearly and I knew which words were needless, then I wouldn't need the book. So, so this is just, I just don't recommend this book. Um, instead, the principles that I am going to uh, uh, focus on in this talk are constructive in the sense that it's easy to check if your text satisfies the principles, and if it doesn't, then the principles will suggest concrete ways of improving it. Um, and these principles don't come out of nowhere. There's several inspirations for the, the things I'll tell you. Um, first and foremost, I want to call your attention to this book by Joseph Williams called Clarity, I'm sorry, called Style Toward Clarity and Grace. Uh, it's a very nice book. It's not perfect, but it's a, uh, and it's, it's not geared specifically towards scientific writing, but it's a, it's, a, it's a very nice book that covers several of the things I'll talk about. Norman Ramsey has some course notes that are based largely on the Joseph Williams book, but also add some additional uh, interesting principles. And Simon Peyton Jones has a very nice talk, some of you may have seen, uh, called How to Write a Great Research Paper, which is uh, complementary to the others. Um, and I would also be remiss if I didn't mention that this talk I really developed jointly with my wife, Rose Hoberman, who, is, uh, who teaches uh, courses in uh, communication skills at the Max Planck Institute for Software Systems, where I work. So we really developed uh, this together, and it's, uh, what I'll talk about it is, is uh, as much her ideas as mine. OK, so let's get to it. So um, I'm going to split the talk into sort of two parts. The first part, I'm going to cover more low-level uh, issues of sentence and paragraph construction. And then in the last part, I'll, I'll talk about the higher-level question of how do you structure a paper. OK. So, um, and I'm not going to cover all the possible principles, all the, all the good principles there are to be learned. I'm just going to focus on the ones I think are the, the most important. And the foremost problem that I see in technical writing is problems with flow. So the idea with flow is, it should be clear how every sentence and paragraph in your paper relates to the adjacent ones, the ones before and after, okay? And the reason is, again, based on this idea of the reader, right? You're sort of dragging the reader along. You want to get the reader from where they are to where you are. And you, they sort of, they're following you link by link. And if there's a broken link, they fall through and they get very confused and unhappy. Um, and so the question then is, how do you actually uh, achieve flow? We'll get to that in a second. I just want to start by giving you a, an example of, uh, of some text with a, with a flow problem. So I'm going to show you some, a paragraph. I'll read it aloud. And then I want you to think, where is the point in this text, or is there a point in this text, uh, where you get a little lost? OK. So, Security proofs of cryptographic protocols are crucial for the security of everyday electronic communication. However, these proofs tend to be complex and difficult to get right. The game playing technique, originally proposed by Jones et al., follows a code-based approach where the security properties are formulated in terms of probabilistic programs called games. This is a general design principle for cryptographic proofs to ease their management. So, third sentence. Right. So, the third sentence here has a problem. So what is, what's actually, the, why did you get confused? I forget who said that, sorry. Yeah. Exactly. The, the previous sentence has set up this, this problem nicely. Uh, the, actually, the first two sentences are quite, are quite good. Uh, they set up the problem that the proofs are, are complex and difficult. But then this seems to be dropped entirely. So what does this game playing technique have to do with anything that came before? Okay? And this kind of thing comes up all the time when I read papers. Um, so uh, so how, can you, how can you avoid this? Or how can you check that your text uh, does not have this problem? So uh, you do this with a, a principle that I call the old to new principle. The idea with old to new is that you should begin your sentences with old information, preferably pretty recent information. Um, and that way it creates a link to the text that came before. And you should end your sentences with new information where you want to go, okay? And that creates a link to the text that follows. And uh, in addition, this also places the new information in a position of emphasis, because readers tend to, as they're reading a sentence, they get sort of more, well, they build up this anticipation, and then uh, that sort of is unloaded on the, the final part of the sentence. So there's a lot of emphasis placed on that, that new part, which is where you want it. So, um, so let's now see how this applies to the example. So you have, uh, in, the, in the example, the problem was that the beginning of the third sentence was talking about this game playing technique, which, is, which was new information. It was what uh, the writer wanted to talk about. Uh, and so it's actually understandable that this problem occurs, because when writers are, are writing, they, they want to get to the new information. That's what they want to tell you about. They're very excited about it. So they tend to sort of put it first, uh, and then explain how it connects to what they did before afterwards. Right? But this is the wrong direction. So the problem is, to fix this, you just have to uh, 
Um, oh, sorry. Uh, the problem is to fix this, we need to somehow uh, start the sentence with old information, connecting it back to that second sentence, and then bring the, uh, the game playing technique into the end of that sentence. So that's what we'll do. So here we could change this to say, to make it easier to manage such proofs, Jones et al. have proposed a new design principle called the game playing technique. This technique follows a code based approach where blah, 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 blah. Okay. So, um, uh, right. So, and then you can check that this actually satisfies all to do by seeing that the, the beginning of each of the sentences refer these proofs, such proofs, this technique, it's always referring to old information. Okay. And the thing we really wanted to put emphasis on in this paragraph, which is the game playing technique, is at the end of a sentence. Okay. So this is a good, uh, so this is good. Um, okay. So, um, so this is a very useful principle. I, I, I apply this all the time in my own writing, but it's not sufficient. Okay. Um, flow is not enough. And to illustrate that, let's look at another paragraph. Um, and I want to see what you think about it. So, uh, lions and tigers are some of the most dramatic and awe-inspiring species of cats. Most of these large cats, however, are currently facing extinction. A smaller cat that has been more evolutionarily successful is the house cat. Although house cats are currently the most popular pet in the world, they are in many ways antisocial. It would therefore be interesting to study whether house cats can be trained to be more sociable. <laughs> so, does anyone have uh, any feelings about this paragraph? Why should you care? Well, okay, that's, that's, uh, that's good, but there's even, uh, I think, uh, yeah. <laughs> it makes you want to fall asleep. Okay, those are, those are all symptoms, yeah. Yes, so exactly. This is more where I'm going. I mean, so the, those were all, those, everything that was said is correct. But the, in some sense, I think that wanting to fall asleep is a symptom of the fact that this text is totally incoherent, okay? It, it's not clear. I mean, there's the, the beginning of the paragraph and the end of the paragraph are on different planets. So um, that said, it has great flow, okay? It perfectly satisfies the old to new principle. So this means you need some other kind of principle. And that principle is, uh, well, so the, the, the goal we're gonna, uh, we want to achieve with this other principle is coherence. That every sentence and paragraph in your text should somehow not only relate to the ones before and after, but to the big picture, to some overarching or some main point that you're trying to make. Okay? Otherwise, the reader will just fall asleep. Um, and the way you can, one way you can, uh, you can encourage this is through something called uh, the one paragraph, one point principle. So the idea is a paragraph should have one main point and that should be ex expressed in a single sentence, which we call the, pr the, the point sentence, okay? Um, now, this point sentence can appear in many places in a paragraph, but typically it should appear at or near the beginning of the paragraph. And the idea is that you use the beginning of the paragraph uh, to sort of set up the point that you're trying to make, and then you use the rest of the paragraph to provide supporting evidence for it. Um, and by the way, again, this may seem like a kind of obvious thing to do, but I can't tell you how many times I read papers, including my own, that violate this principle, okay? And I think, I often go back to my old papers and I say, well, this could actually be really improved if I had only followed this, uh, uh, this principle. So, uh, so the problem indeed, indeed in, this, in this paragraph you could identify by just saying there's no single sentence here that identifies the main point that's being expressed because in fact there's multiple points. Um, let me just give you, an, so I can't really fix that paragraph, but I can give you a slightly different one that is on a related topic. There appears to be a negative correlation between the charisma of a species and its ability to survive. Uh, lions and tigers, for instance, are among the most majestic creatures in the animal kingdom, yet they are currently facing extinction. In contrast, the house cat is evolutionarily quite successful, even though it is mostly known for stupid pet tricks. <laughs> so this is a good, uh, this is, I think, a very nice paragraph. The first sentence clearly states the, the point of the paragraph, and then the remaining two sentences give you uh, more evidence for that. Okay, so those, so we had flow, creating flow with old to do, creating coherence with one paragraph, one point. Um, I don't have, you know, a lot more time to go into these sentence level uh, or these low level uh, points, but I wanted to mention two other principles that I think are very important, just briefly. Um, one of them I call name your baby, and the idea is that um, when you have uh, things that you talk about frequently in your text, then you should give them unique names, right? And, moreover, you should refer to them by those names consistently. Don't give them multiple names for the same thing, and then, you know, sometimes refer to it by one and sometimes by the other. Just as when you have a baby, you don't just like you know, give it random names and start talking it, uh, start <laughs> talking it to uh, uh, using those different names. Okay, um, uh, so again, it seems kind of obvious when you say it, but uh, it, I find this really helps in making text more clear. Uh, the other one is the just-in-time principle. Um, uh, the just-in-time principle is basically that you should only give information, particularly technical information, precisely when it is needed and not before. 
So I see this violated all the time when people think that, you know, they have to give this background information at this early point in the paper so that the reader understands the, the area or something like this. And then later on, they assume that the reader still remembers that background information five pages later. Well, no, this doesn't work, okay. Only give this technical information that, that you want the reader to, to know about at the point where you're gonna actually use it, where you actually depend on that. Okay, so um, moving on. Uh, I want to talk about the structure of a research paper, so popping up to a higher level. Now, there's many different ways to write a research paper. So if anyone tells you there's only one way, they're wrong, okay? But I'm going to tell you one way. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a way that I find works. I don't always use it, but when I do use it, I find it it's almost always guarantees the paper is going to be pretty readable. Uh, so if, I can, if you can fit your paper into the structure, you're in good shape. So um, Basically, so the, the high-level bit is you have, okay, the abstract, of course, it's like one or two paragraphs. You have an introduction, about one or two pages. A main ideas section, uh, which is usually around two or three pages. Then you have the technical meat of the paper, which is this, this sort of the core part that's, that's, that can be longer, four to six pages. And then you end with some related work. Now, um, uh, I'm going to go into detail uh, about all of these sections except for one. Can anyone guess which one it is? Yes, okay, good. Uh, and you, can you guess why? I mean, so it looks a little odd, right? Because that takes up most of the paper, it seems like. Half the paper, at least. So why am I not talking about it? Five readers. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so that's perhaps a, uh, an underestimate, but not by much, okay? Mostly, you know, the vast majority of people who read your paper will not read the technical section. So if you're going to invest effort in improving your writing, focus elsewhere first. Uh, and so that's why I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on the other sections. Um, okay, so we'll start with the abstract and the intro. So I'm, I'm going to present my advice for the abstract and intro as sort of one bit of advice, uh, uh, basically because I think of the, in, the abstract as kind of a, just a compressed version of the intro. So it's basically the, the, the principles for writing one are the same as for the other. So, um, so the idea uh, here, what I call the CGI model, okay, so context gap innovation. The idea is, again, you're trying to get, you know, trying to get uh, the attention of the reader, right? So you need to get the reader from where they are to where you are, and inter which means interested in the, in the work you're doing. So, uh, what, so the first step here, the context step, is sort of setting the stage and motivating the general topic, uh, thereby sort of making the reader feel comfortable. You're sort of starting in a, in a shared space where everyone sort of agrees on uh, uh, some basic knowledge or some basic uh, um, uh, appreciation of this general topic. Then once you've set that stage, and usually that's pretty quick, like a paragraph or two at most, then, uh, I'm sorry, in, in, in an intro, in, a, in an abstract, maybe one sentence. Um, uh, then you move to the gap, okay? And this is critical. This is where you explain your specific problem. You sort of narrow things down to the specific problem you're working on, and, uh, and you explain why existing work does not adequately solve it, okay? Um, a lot of people, I, this is the, probably the most common problem in abstracts and intros that I find is that people do not clearly explain what the gap is, right? Sort of, they don't say what, it is the pro what exactly is the problem they're solving. They just sort of set the context and then they say, we did something. Um, so you have to explain the gap. And then once you've done that, then you move to innovation. You state what you've done that is new and you explain, uh, you tie it back into the gap. You explain how it helps fill the gap. It doesn't have to completely fill the gap. Uh, you know, we typically don't solve, completely solve some open problem in one paper, but it should make some progress toward the gap. And in the innovation part is where you clearly explain what that bit is. So um, I'm just going to show you a positive example in this case uh, in the form of an abstract for this talk that you've been hearing, okay? Um, so we could start with the context. Learning to write well is an essential part of becoming a successful researcher, okay? Eh, we can all probably agree on that. Everyone feels comfortable with that statement, nothing too controversial. Then the gap. Unfortunately, many researchers find it very hard to write well because they do not know how to view their paper uh, for their text from the perspective of the reader. Okay, we've now, that's set up in, setting up a clear problem. And now the innovation comes in to say what we're doing. In this talk, we present a simple set of principles for good writing based on an understanding of how readers process information. Unlike such platitudes as be clear or omit needless words, our principles are constructive. One can easily check whether a piece of text satisfies them. And if it doesn't, then the principles suggest concrete, concrete ways to improve it. Okay, so you'll see here the innovation section is actually quite a bit longer. That's mainly because you typically have this two parts of it where you first state what you did. That was the first sentence, uh, this first sentence, uh, we present a simple set of principles, and then you tie it back in and explain how that addresses the gap. Okay, so again, this seems, it should seem like a natural thing, okay? But many papers don't uh, adhere to this. Um, so I, that was an example of an abstract. An introduction, as I said, I think is basically the same principle for how you set it up. 
However, there is disagreement about this. So um, Simon Peyton Jones in his talk has presents a, 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 advocates for an alternative approach, uh, which is basically to eliminate the context. So uh, he, he sort of says you should just start out with a concrete example. For example, you would say, you know, consider the following Haskell code. And uh, uh, that sets up, sort of explains the problem immediately using some, some concrete example. I think if this works, it can be very effective. And you should try to do it whenever you can. But I personally find it often doesn't work for the kind of papers that I write. Uh, it's just, A, it's hard to get a concrete example that people can, that you can assume a general audience can understand right away. And B, it assumes that the reader already has some shared context with you that this kind of, that, you know, like caring about uh, this particular kind of Haskell code is something the reader thinks is important. Which sometimes it is, it depends on the audience. Um, okay, so I just wanted to mention there are, there are uh, alternative approaches. Okay. Um, so, uh, the next section is the main ideas section. All right, and the main ideas section is sort of falling in between the intro, which is stating your high-level contributions, and the technical meat, which is saying, going into all the gore gory details. So, you can think of the main ideas section as kind of the whiteboard version of your paper. So, if you were explaining your, your, your paper to someone uh, at the whiteboard, uh, this is the level of, of abstraction I'm talking about. So, that means... You don't give the general solution. You don't talk about the general solution at all, maybe. You just use concrete illustrative examples uh, to show uh, how your idea plays out um, uh, in, a, yeah, in a more concrete way. Uh, and you give high-level intuition, okay? Um, so uh, that, that's the basic idea of the main idea section. And there's no specific way to write this kind of section. You just think of it in terms of a whiteboard presentation. So the real thing, the thing I want to talk about here is why have a main idea section at all? Because lots of papers don't have them. Um, and my feeling is it's really important to try to have one. Uh, the first reason is it forces you to have main ideas, <laughs> okay. um, uh, uh, which you can think of as a kind of takeaway. Because a, a lot of readers don't actually care about the technical section. As I said, there's only like five people who are, uh, who are reading the technical section. Um, so many readers just want the takeaway. They just want the main ideas. So why not give it to them explicitly in, the in, this, in this form, in this section? That way they can read the first four pages of the paper and feel like they got their money's worth, so to speak. Okay, um, so that's, that's one reason. The other is that even for the experts who uh, want to know the technical details, even for them, these main ideas are really useful as a form of scaffolding. So they sort of, they, uh, they build up this structure so that when the reader gets to the, uh, the technical section, they, um, they can follow it much more easily. Okay. Oh, yeah, and one thing I wanted to just add about this. So, uh, and I, just a sort of anecdote. So, on, I was on the Popple External Review Committee this year, and there was one paper that was extremely technically complicated uh, that I was reviewing, um, and, but it had a main ideas section. And the main ideas section was beautiful. It gave a very nice explanation of, of the intuitions uh, behind the whole technique. The rest of the paper was rough going, but because of that main idea section, I felt like I had a basic grasp on what they were trying to do. And I was like ec ecstatic, you know, strong accept, strong accept. And the, the other committee's members thought I was nuts because usually I give these negative reviews. Uh, so, um, uh, <laughs> so they didn't know what got into me, but I was like, this is a beautiful main idea section. So, you know, uh, please reviewers like me by writing such a section. Um, okay, and finally, I just have one slide on related work. And then I'm, I'm wrapping up. So, um, so related work, the main thing, there's two, th two main things to know about it. Um, one is it should go at the end of the paper. Okay, some people like to put their related work section early in the paper, right after the introduction. Don't do it. I, there's, there's, a, there's only very rarely is it a good idea to do I mean, I would say basically as a rule, don't do it. Put it at the end because you can only properly compare it to related work once you've explained what you're doing. Uh, and so it only makes sense to put it at the end. Otherwise, it also sort of just distracts the reader's attention early on. They get confused. It's a bad idea. So put it at the end. The other thing is, um, don't write a laundry list. So people, this is a major mistake people make all the time, and which gets papers rejected too. They write a laundry list, they say, okay, ABC did this, XYZ did that uh, for 10 papers, and you have no idea what that actually, that's not what the reader wants to know. Again, the reader wants to know how, you know, what, uh, how is your work filling the gap that you stated in the introduction in a way that the related work doesn't. That's what they want to know. And that's what you should tell them uh, uh, in this section. Okay. so. To summarize, uh, I've given you a bunch of principles, um, a couple of principles for the lower level writing, like the old to new principle for uh, flow, one paragraph, one point for coherence, name your baby in just in time, and then uh, these pretty simple principles for how to structure the paper. If you can follow, if you can, and these are things you can check. If, you follow, if, if your paper follows these principles, 
uh, it has a very good chance of being understandable. Thank you. Uh, and the question is, what's your take on the conclusion? Should it just repeat the abstract oh, you mean, as many papers do? You, you mean, in, you mean in, in the structure of the paper? In the structure of the paper. Yeah, I usually don't have a conclusion. Occasionally I do. I mean, the only reason, in my opinion, to have a conclusion is if you have something interesting to say about future work, sort of the, what, what, what problems you didn't solve. And yeah, if you have something nice to say there, that's good. I mean, it's, it's fine to have a, so a bit about future work. I often merge that into sort of uh, sprinkle it in the discussion of related work. As I'm comparing to other things, I say, well, and this sort of suggests naturally a direction for future work. But I don't, in general, I think conclusions are not so necessary. Yeah. What do you think of the so-called roadmap paragraph, the, the thing that you usually oh. have at the end of the introduction that says, in section seven, we will discuss so on? Yeah, so, so, si so if you've seen Simon Payne Jones talk, he really hates the, the overview paragraph. Uh, I could, uh, I could, Take it or leave it. I, I don't actually. Sometimes I have it in. Sometimes I don't. I, the main reason. Okay, I'll be more serious. The, the main reason that I think it can be useful um, is if you can't do what he suggests. So what he suggests is you have this bulleted list of contributions at the end of your intro, and for each one you say, okay, here's this contribution, section two. Here's this other contribution, section three, and you sort of you have you have a clear mapping of contributions to sections. But I find sometimes the contributions of my paper don't fall out naturally as into the sections of the paper. So then it's kind of awkward, and I prefer to have this, this little overview paragraph. But even then, sometimes you don't need it. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a minor point, in my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that are good or bad? OK. <laughs> OK, all right. Yeah, right. Uh, um, not off the top of my, I mean, I, certainly I know good papers. They're, yeah. they're very good papers. Uh, I, I thought, yeah. My wife, Rose, suggested that I was going to get this question, so, um, but I didn't, of course, think about what an answer was. So uh, um, there, are, there are, I mean, here, here's a hint. If you find a paper with a main ideas section, um, then that's a good sign. <laughs> Thanks. It's often, by the way, not called the main ideas. It can be called the key ideas or the high-level picture or something like this, but it's usually pretty early and right after the introduction. I'll tell you how I write abstracts. I, uh, I write them at the very end, and I, what I do is I look over my intro, and I figure out how can I summarize, you know, like I take a couple paragraphs, and I'll turn that into one sentence. Uh, this is, and then I, I check it over for basic, you know, flow and uh, those other sentence level properties. But so I, I, uh, I view it as essentially just a very condensed version of the intro. I don't think it should have it. Basically, they should be covering the same information. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, it depends. So if you really need to introduce some technical preliminaries, even in order to explain your main ideas, then do so. But make it very quick, because you want to get to the main ideas as quickly as possible. You don't want to be uh, beating around the bush. Um, it's fine later on to have some preliminaries. But you know, when people have like a page of preliminaries, it, then it makes my eyes glaze over. So, you're looking for, you know, a couple paragraphs of preliminaries is, is okay. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, I'm writing a paper right now, right, that, that like, applies to the Alton Kapapa domain. Yeah. And it seems really hard to, you know, describe this entire domain at the point where it's actually needed, right? Like, it might make sense to have a major so that just explains that it's the main thing. So where did you want, where do you need to put that, uh, the explanation of that domain? Huh? You mean you want to put that, you want to have a page somewhere between the intro and your main yeah, ideas or something like this? Section, yeah, I so, yeah. I mean, you can have some background, but it, you should, I'm just saying, keep it as short as possible. And think about what you really need to explain in order to get to the high level. You may want, I mean, another thing you can do is have a really high level ideas and then sort of zoom into somewhat lower level ideas uh, and then you go into the full technical details. But you want to have something that someone can read without, you know, having to read pages of pages of math. 
Last question. Oh, yeah. I mean, well, uh, yeah, the structure of a book is clearly quite different. But, um, uh, but I think, you know, it, it's, it, uh, generally these kind of principles do scale in terms of uh, uh, the ideas about pr first presenting ideas at a higher level and then zooming into a lower level. These ideas about coherence, you want, you know, the coherence should not only apply to paragraphs, it should apply to whole sections and then to whole chapters. Right, um, you should have basically sort of point sentences or point paragraphs at the beginning of a section, just like you have point sentences at the beginning of a paragraph. So, uh, yeah, I think it does scale. Okay, I guess that's, unless there's other questions. Thank you. <laughs>